Excellent. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Brad Larkin, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Brad is going to uh, give us two lectures. He's flown all the way over from Houston, Texas, and his first lecture is the one that he's giving today, which is DNA versus the Irish Annals. So this will be absolutely fascinating. And tomorrow, Brad is talking about the future of genetic genealogy. So that is something that will be of particular interest to a lot of the DNA aficionados that I see in the audience. Um, Brad is editor of the Surname DNA Journal. Uh, he set this up a couple of years ago to fill a gap where JOG, uh, the Journal of Genetic Genealogy, uh, had been suspended. And his Surname DNA Journal has really gone from strength to strength. Uh, and that contains a lot of very, very insightful and well-written articles. He's also the founder of Genetic Homeland, um, dot com, which Brad will tell you a little bit about. And he's also a DNA project administrator, a member of ISOG, and a member of the Southern California Genealogical Society. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome <coughs> Brad Larkin, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mars. You can all hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I'm here today to talk to you about uh, DNA versus the Irish Annals. Um, what, uh, what we've had is, when we first had DNA tests, we hoped they would tell us, you know, everything about all our ancestors, right? Wouldn't that have been great? And of course, it doesn't, it doesn't quite do that. But what, uh, as we get more samples in and we get more testing done and we just kind of globally understand this better, it is starting to tell us and inform some questions that relate to early history and the medieval period and then as well as the later period in terms of your deep genealogies. So this, this slide is kind of the overview that was in the, uh, on the website. We're going to talk about major Irish genealogical groups, such as the O'Neill, then the provincial kings of Connacht, Munster, Leinster, Ulster, as well as some Norman lineages. We're going to review how much modern DNA has been linked to these lineages and how consistent those DNA findings are to the ancient genealogies. So this presentation is well suited for those who like to connect historical figures to your genetic genealogy research. I want to say a few, uh, a few prefaces, kind of some base assumptions going into this, which is that when I say annals, I'm really referring to all the different kinds of Irish written material from about the year 500 to 1700, typically written in, uh, in Gaelic or Latin. So it could, some, are, some are literally annals, some are um, you know, genealogies, oral histories, and so forth. Prior to the Christian era, Druids kept history very carefully, and they studied it a great deal. Julius Caesar mentions that uh, some Druids would study for 20 years memorizing the oral histories, but they didn't write it down. But uh, so anyway, so the, the writing was capturing a much older oral tradition that goes back a very long way. For this presentation, I tried to put an emphasis on new data, fresh looks for most of these. You're going to see some percentages of haplogroup such and such is such and such percentage of this other. I tried to do fresh calculations for that, incorporating the very latest uh, DNA. Um, findings and samples. Um, one of the things that's going on this year especially is on the Y-DNA, and that's most of what this talk is going to be focused on is Y-DNA. We have uh, what we call an SMP tsunami, where there are lots of new markers being discovered because we're sampling much more of the Y-chromosome. So literally things are coming out every week, and uh, citizen scientists are, are doing a lot of this work, but it's also matching what they're doing at university research centers. Uh, and dedicated genealogists like yourself. So some established intellectual paradigms may be challenged in this presentation, uh, especially those that are kind of what I'll call Kelto skeptics. Okay. So the presentation approach I've got for today is to talk about what the annals and the genealogies say, then what the DNA findings say, and then compare and contrast where they seem aligned or not aligned. So uh, let's take a, a little sample. How many of you have ever looked at the genealogies in the annals or the old written things? How, how many people do that? Okay, quite a lot. Okay, and if I say an S and P marker, how many of you? How many of you don't really know what I mean when I say an S and P marker? Anybody? Okay. So there are other other um, instructional periods here to learn more about that. For this presentation, because it's gonna it's gonna start at a fairly high level and go. Basically, what it means is. It's a distinct mutation that we can use to say it happened at some point in time and we can separate people and say some of them have it, some of them don't. 
So it helps us separate kind of population or genetic groups. And, and Morris's slides there looking at the spirins were, were good examples of, of basically saying once it happens, all these people have that marker, their cousins don't. And so basically we just keep keep looking for those markers through through all of uh, you know all of Western Europe, all mankind. So this basically just means a, a marker that we can separate people with. And we'll skip all the because from a genealogical standpoint, that's what it means. Okay. So with that said, so there's gonna there is gonna be a lot of alphabet soup of markers here. It's not really important that you know all the markers. We are gonna eventually fit it into a kind of a tree like you're used to seeing. Um, so kind of at the end, we'll come back to this and we can look at this in a little more detail. That's kind of the punchline. But now let's go back to the beginning and uh, and talk about the annals. We're gonna look at the prehistoric period. Legends of Irish Invasion, and major Y-DNA haplogroup evidence. Prehistoric island, they tell us stories about the Fairbolg, the Tua de Danon, the Milesians. The Milesians came from Spain to Ireland after the Deluge. They defeated the Fairbolg and the Tua de Danon, and uh, they were pretty much designed to be the ancestors of all the medieval Irish kings. They pretty much dominated the island. And at one time they were labeled as Celtic, and then became unfashionable to say that, and there were some people that said, there's no evidence of Celtic infusion into Ireland, right? So that's what uh, some people have said. So let's look at ancient DNA, going way back. Now, originally, there's, as, as Morris pointed out in his presentation, it's a lot easier and there's a lot more mitochondrial DNA to get out of old ancient bones. So all the first results of ancient DNA, when they went, like the king in the car park, they did mitochondrial because it's a lot easier to get a hold of. Okay? But as our technology has been advancing and our techniques have been advancing, they're starting to get nuclear and Y DNA out of ancient uh, remains. So this is kind of a summary table of the Y DNA results we've gotten out of Europe that relate back to the Stone Age. Uh, Cheddarman in England, of course, a very old one. Not properly published, though, but Sweden, they're in haplogroup I. Germany, haplogroup G and F. Spain, 5000 BC, G2. Otzi, the Iceman, everybody's heard of Otzi, right? He's G2. France, uh, G2, and some M223, okay? So, um, basically, when we look at the ancient Y DNA, it's pretty much haplogroups G and I. And there's no R in there right, from 3,000, 8,000 BC. And Mars already showed you um, a distribution of R, but this, just to flash forward, this is the current distribution of Ireland today based on samples in the Ireland Y-DNA project. Haplogroup G has basically disappeared almost, 1%. Okay, and haplogroup I is, is vastly outnumbered 7 to 1 by R. Okay, so from 4,000, 5,000 BC to now, it's been a big change in the Y-DNA. Let's, let's look at the modern distribution of the G2A uh, haplogroup. Uh, it was once dominant in the Stone Age in Europe, as I was saying. It's now rare, except in a few regions, such as um, Turkey, Anatolia, uh, Sardinia, Italy. So it is around, but uh, not, so much, not so much here in Northwest Europe. Let's look, at another, let's look at another way of comparing, which is to look at archaeology, kind of the integrated disciplines approach, archaeology. Um, they also look at the DNA traces of cattle and, you know, the see when cattle and different types of grains were introduced here. And to kind of summarize a lot of work in one slide, about 8,000 BC, the first evidence of humans in Ireland. About 4,000 BC, Neolithic cattle and farming and stoneworks. Uh, I got a chance to go to Newgrange. I think they date that right around 3,000, 3,500 BC, somewhere in there. And then they say there, there are signs of a population collapse of somewhere around 2,500 BC, uh, along with evidence of metallurgy, metalworking, and the Bell Beaker culture arriving in Ireland. Okay, so this is this is really mostly archaeology and the interdisciplinary approach. That's the story they're telling. Okay. Let's look at what the DNA is telling us about the R haplogroup, the now, the now dominant one. This is a, a map showing kind of how the different sub-branches of R, those different SMP markers, by using them to date, like in Turkey they'll have a certain variation, then in Central Europe they'll have another variation, and until you get up here, 
a lot of people have that RM222 mutation that Professor Lewis Gates has that I have as well. Okay, so this dating, there's different ways people can argue about the dates when it comes here. This dating gives you about 2000, 2100 BC, RL21 variation comes to uh, the British Isles. Okay, so looking specifically, <coughs> so <clears throat> I put the slide up here. Could the two of the Danon have been early haplogroup I M222, oops, I M223 hunter gatherers? Could the Ferrobola be those Neolithic farmers who are G2A? Does the Milesian invasion correspond with late arriving metalworking warrior culture of cults who have the RL21 Y DNA? Okay, so there's nothing conclusive, but a case can be made that the modern DNA is kind of consistent with the Irish origin stories in Laragavala Aaron. So, and if you know, if you if you want to get into like, well, it couldn't be the Tua de Danon, you know, I don't know. Well, there has to be a Tua to something. Do we call them the Tua to IM two twenty three? You know, I don't know. I'll let other people decide. Okay. Moving now into more of the medieval kingship and surname formation era, we're going to talk about kind of sub-branches of SMPs that are associated with cultural identities that are better known, Vikings, Germanic, uh, Celtic, and so forth. And we're going to talk a little bit about Celtic kingship and how that evolves into surnames, which probably a lot of you know, but I'm trying to cover all bases. This is a real quick slide on broad history of Ireland, just by cultural eras for anybody that's I imagine most of you are pretty keen historians, and you don't need this slide at all. Um, but we just talk about that uh, Anglo-Saxon conquest of Britain and the Dalriada colonized Britain, uh, northwestern Britain, about 400 to 800. Viking era, Norman invasion, end of Gaelic law and land ownership, Scottish plantation, Irish diaspora. So you all know those things pretty well, but in case there's anybody that wasn't sure. Okay, now we're going to talk about these cultural SMP markers. Uh, on Y-DNA, we have uh, four pretty good markers that roughly correspond to these cultural groups. IM223, as I said before, <laughs> seems to be the, the, the pre-R1B Europeans, the ones that have been here the longest, very long time. I believe uh, the Sparrens were part of that group, yes? Uh -huh. uh, IM253, Norris Viking, RU106, Germanic, and RL21 corresponds with Gaelic-speaking and I would argue Celtic culture. Remember, these are just oversimplifications. Uh, other haplogroups are in our populations, of course, at lower concentrations. These are just some of the biggest groups. And real, real populations were diverse. The Vikings were a diverse population a thousand years ago, just as we are today. But they do help us kind of tell the story and understand some of the history and how DNA can apply to it. I've done some maps here, the IM223 group. Uh, like I said, they're surviving pre-R1B European population. Uh, in the modern era, they tend to be identified with Germanic language and culture. Uh, and they were formerly called I2, or they can also be called the I2. There's been a switch in nomenclature where we switch to the specific marker. IM223 is a specific marker designation. It's a spot, it's a spot on your DNA, on your Y-DNA. IM253, Viking haplogroups formerly known as I1. There's another haplogroup that has a similar distribution, R1A, which follows the same pattern but at a lower frequency. So you can see there it's strong on the eastern coast of Britain, some in Northeast Ireland, as well as uh, kind of your, your Scandinavian areas. RU106 corresponds to Anglo-Saxon areas of uh, Germanic languages. This marker was also known as RS21, same marker. And so if you read some of the earlier literature, from five years ago, they're going to tend to call it S21, so you have to know that we're talking about the same thing. Uh, I did an article on the Y DNA of the British monarchy, and quite a lot of them are R1 U106. And now L21 corresponds to Gaelic languages in the historical period. Over 80% of Irish males are L21. And so because so many Irish males are L21, R1B, uh, we're constantly, we're never satisfied with that. We're constantly probing to go deeper. What's my subclad? You know, where, where, where do I connect to the Nile of the Nine hostages? So there have been a, a variety of studies where we have uh, specific markers within that RM22, 222, 
for Irish type 1, CTS4466 for Irish type 2, L226 for Irish type 3 or South Irish, and Clan Cola, who are R1B with DYS425 null. So these are kind of some big, big subgroups of L21. They're all L21, and then they have these additional markers. Okay, going back to the annals a little bit, Milesian lineages. What they tried to do there in the Lair Gavala is to assign, they said that all these Irish kings were basically descended of, uh, of the Milesians, and they assigned the various lineages into some, one of the three sons. So the O'Brien and the Dalgash to uh, Aber, as well as McCarthy, um, O'Neill to Harriman, Dalriada to Ur, and so forth. So that's you know, kind of the ancient. I have one slide in here on the nature of Gaelic kingship. Probably most of you know it, but basically small, mediums, large sizes. Uh, alternating succession of kin groups was a common feature as a means of conciliation and or warfare. And then from that, in an agrarian society, surnames become important because they how you kind of are able to work the land. They're a cornerstone of debt in Gaelic society. There's lots of brand law around father-son relationships. And so surnames evolved from uh, an ancestor chieftain when, uh, on the one hand, I don't know, maybe they got tired of saying Mac, 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 Mac. And I've got an illustration here from, uh, these are three actual entries from the annals from about 1890 year 936, 955, where Lorcan, MacMorin, MacFlan, MacInrac, MacMaldun, and then probably his son, Donald MacLorcan, and then Reagan, MacFinocta, O'Larkin died. Okay, so that last use there, 955, that's where it's really become a surname. Something that was a first name has now become a surname. So, it's going to come into play as we now look at some of the individual regions around Ireland and, and how these go. In Ulster, Northern Ireland, we're going to talk about Anile, Argyala, and Ula. So the Anile, uh, Dan Bradley did a famous Trinity College study, sampled 17 STR markers across Ireland, and they came up with this genetic signature that has been had several different kind of names applied to it, Northwest Irish, Irish Type 1, we're now calling it RM222 because that's the specific marker that uh, a lot of these men have. About 15% of the men from Ireland have this genetic signature. So for one SMP, that's quite a large chunk. And it was hypothesized to be descendants of Nile, of the Nine Hostages. So the Nile themselves is a political entity kind of split into two groups. The Northern Nile that were centered around Tyrone. They descended into many surnames, not the O'Neill surname, but many other names. And uh, Patrick Guinness is going to do a presentation, I think, focused on them here this week, and so you definitely would, should check that out. Uh, the Southern O'Neill ruled from Tara and Mate, and they, some of them adopted the O'Neill surname. But in the 2006 DNA study, uh, they found that a lot of these people weren't M222 at all. Uh, they have a totally different Y-DNA lineage. So they suspect there was a non-paternal event in there somewhere so that um, uh, there's a, a different lineage there. So that was the case where um, what we were told in the annals turned out to be have one conflict there with the DNA because there was a line there that we wouldn't have suspected from the annals. The Argyala was a distinct kingdom in Ulster, said to be settled by descendants of three brothers in the 4th century, the three Colas. I'm curious, how many of you have heard of the three Colas before? About half? Okay. So, some genealogies claim they were descendants of Khan of the Hundred Battles. It would be kind of connected to the Anile. Some scholars doubted the three Colas even existed, saying they were legendary, they were a fiction, they were another name for Oniles, and so people actually said... Uh, the three colas are sort of aliases for, th they actually found three brothers of the O'Niles and said they were aliases for them. But what's happened now is that with the DNA, uh, these guys have worked on this project. There's 33 Argyala affiliated surnames that have a distinct marker. It's uh, RL21 with DYS425 null, meaning there's a piece of DNA that's been sort of deleted or slipped out. 
So this gives them a very, a very clear marker. And so it looks like the legend of the three colas looks very true. There were some families that were centered there um, up in the north. They're not a Nile, but um, they have a lot of descendants. So in terms, of, in terms of DNA versus the annals, the annals were right. There were three colas, but sometimes people tried to link them or graft them onto the O'Neill. That looks false. Okay, the Ola. Ancient peoples of Northeast Ireland, uh, their power seemed to have waned some in the Christian era, so much so that some 19th century genealogy writers thought, well, maybe they're a blend or a fairy tale or something. And of course... They'd be hard to sample for DNA because that territory was heavily planted by Scots in the 17th century. So, you know, how we, could we ever solve this, this mystery? Some surnames said to be affiliated with them were McNally, McNulty, Dunleavy, Larkin, and most of these have minimal DNA samples. But since I'm working hard to sample every Larkin lineage in Ireland, uh, I've, I've, I've done some sampling of them, and I noted that one of our analysts, independent and before we had DNA study, had noted that these families were all noted as being from two races. One from Clan Cola and one basically from Clan Arori. Okay, So that was a story that if you read the annals closely, you would see they said they're from two different sources. Now we're testing the modern DNA of Larkins up in, the, in that area, and it seems to be true. Some of them are Clan Cola and some of them are RL21 star where they're not, they're not to O'Neill or anything else. So the annals look very correct in attributing this to two sources. Okay, Dalrita. Described as an early sub-kingdom of the Ulad, reputed to have emigrated from Ireland to Scotland due to pressure in, in the 6th century. They spanned the Irish Sea for some time. Um, politically, they brought Christianity and Gaelic language to, uh, to Scotland with them. Uh, but on the other hand, their migration was so ancient, it was in such a period where there's limited historical records that some people thought maybe they didn't exist or that they cannot be differentiated from the indigenous people of Scotland, the Picts. So let's take a look at a surname and, and just see what we can see. We'll look at the Macaulay surname, the spelling variations. This is a map from the Macaulay DNA project. And there's a lot of them in the north of Ireland, some in England, some in the islands. So, okay. And then if you look at the subgroups of the DNA project for Macaulay, you've got 8% that have the CTS4466, 3% have haplogroup I, 26%, the biggest single portion, have M222. Only 1% has Clan Cola. 14% have what was called the Scottish modal, CTS11722. 15% have just M269, that's kind of generic Western Atlantic modal haplotype. So I ask you, which of these DNA groups are the Dalrita? Right? It's hard to tell. So I present this stuff because in some cases we have pedigrees or we find things and it starts to make a case, but lots of times, the majority of time, you kind of can't, or you get these sort of, you know, indistinct results, right? So that's just, that's just, that's just, and you get this in your own genealogies when you're trying to, okay, how do I triangulate these cousins? But if you keep working at it, keep digging, and keep testing more people with DNA, chances are you can make breakthroughs in the future that you, it was hard to see that you were going to get there when you start. And that's a little bit of what we had with uh, the Dalrieta, okay? Because not so much in Ireland... But if we go over and look in Scotland, there's some very active people doing DNA research in Scotland. And they believe they've identified a marker that's present in all the surnames descended from Kenneth MacAlpin, King of Alba. Okay? He led the, some Irish Scots in 839 in a three-way battle with the Picts and the Norse. So if it was a three-way battle, clearly you know, they, weren't that, they weren't feeling that friendly at that time. And uh, the outcome of the battle was that they ended up dominating the Picts and it formed the, the modern kingdom of Scotland, and a lot of people consider him kind of the first king of the Scots. Well, if you look at the old annals, he's descended from the Dalrita. So the DNA evidence suggests that many of these surnames linked to him have been identified with the CTS-11722 marker. Some surnames like McGregor, McCray, Campbell, Buchanan, McKinnon, McPhee, McQuarrie. So these surnames have a, a very large 
contingent of CTS-11722. And a lady named Alice Fair Fairhurst, who's very involved with ISOG, uh, is also a big driver in this DNA project and this research. And so she's a big source for me in this regard. So again, ISOG doing great things. So this is evidence that these Highland Scots are indeed descendants of the Dalrita. So there what we had was we sort of found a pedigree outside of Ireland and a marker. So if you go back to look at the Macaulay's, okay, the second one from the bottom, Scottish modal, CTS11722, that 14%, those are going to be the Macaulay's that are Dalrita. So we actually have figured it out. But we had to kind of find an external reference to do it. Okay, now let's talk about Connacht and the Hymani. The original Connacht tribe from the Annals were descended from Khan of the Hundred Battles and two of Nile and Nine Hostages brothers who became overlords of the Fairbolg peoples of Western Ireland. Again, this is the story the Annals tell us. They say that population pressure in Ulster inspired Manny Moore to reconquer and occupy southern Connacht in the fourth century, established the kingdom of Hamani that lasted a thousand years, and it was concentrated around the Shannon River Valley in East Galway, the Roscommon area. Okay. So in the annals, the tree that they give us shows kind of the hundred battles. Uh, the, the identification of Manny Moore's father is a bit contentious. Scholars have disagreed. The most well-known cases think he was part of Clan Cola, that he was a son of, of Domnall. Others think he was a son of another man named Domnall, who was actually part of the O'Neill. And so there are, several, there are several characters named Manny at roughly the same point in time in the history. So that's where... Um, there's conflict even within the annals. But anyway, if you follow on down through the Middle Ages, uh, the Kingdom of Hymani leads to a number of surnames such as these at the bottom, O'Connor, O'Kelly, Egan, Madden, and Larkin. These are well recognized as being having concentrations there in the Shannon River Valley. Let's look at the O'Connors. There are six sets of O'Connors cited in the annals. Um, the O'Connor of Connacht, of course, was a very legendary one because the high king at the time of the Norman invasion was Rory O'Connor. And uh, although he also did some controversial stuff, so some of the monks that wrote the annals thought it was appropriate that his, his personal paternal line dottered out there in the, around the uh, 13th century. Be that as it may, of course, there are still lots of O'Connors around. But the O'Connor DNA project has not been able to link any particular DNA samples to the sets that are listed in the annals. Okay. So that's pretty typical, you know. You you got to go out and you got to gather a lot of samples from that area, people with deep roots, to start putting the puzzle together. And until you get those samples here in Ireland, uh, it's hard to do. And that's why you all coming here and, and encouraging people to get tested is very important to all this. Uh, as just a, a note of trivia, it is interesting. The one, um, the one Galway man they have is I M two twenty three, which also would be consistent with those sparings of those early. European ancestors, but with only uh, a small data point, we can't draw any big conclusions. Okay. Now the O'Kellys, on the other hand, have a very well-developed DNA project with quite a bit of sampling. Uh, the largest group from Hamani are close to the M222, but they're actually negative for that. But they have a marker that's just upstream of it called Z2961 that's been discovered here just in the last year or two. And the other thing the O'Kellys have is they have a pretty good pedigree back to William Boy O'Kelly, who died in 1381, but he was a documented Gaelic chief of Hymani. And they have pretty good pedigrees down from there. So they kind of give us a route to say, okay, at least at this point in time, the king of Hymani, who is reputed to be a descendant of Manny Moore, was Z2961. So... Other Kelly Project members in that area, though, have both M222 and don't have M222. So let's look at some of those other surnames that are supposed to be affiliated with Hymani. Egan and Larkin are two, okay? So Egan and Larkin, we both have well-developed DNA projects. We have uh, kind of roots rooted in that area, but we weren't chiefs or kings. We tended to be recognized as Aranaz or Brehens. And our DNA projects are overwhelmingly M222. Uh, other names in the, that come to us from the annals like Madden, Mooney, Mulali don't have really enough samples linked to that area. So if we put it together and look at kind of the picture of Hamani DNA right now, you can see the Kellys have a mix, 39% with 
just with M222 and 34% with 2961. Larkin's M222, Egan's 44%. If you look in the third column, it's a bit pointy. If you look, <clears throat> so up here, you have a mix, M222, M22 overwhelmingly. There's really no clan cola, right? And we know that this, this line here is the uh, William Bo Boyle Kelly line. So what I'm going to say that this tells us is that for those, because there are people who are skeptical that Khan of the Hundred Battles even existed. Okay, well, there's somebody that we might call Khan of the Khan of the RZ two nine six one, who is a common ancestor for all these people in Connacht, because these two markers are right next to each other on the tree. So, in this case, I would say this is a little bit of a correction to the the tree on the annals, where Khan of the Hundred Battles. Well, certainly with Z2961, Nile of the Nine Hostages is one of his descendants. Manny Moore is uh, a descendant through some lines that are disputed. Somewhere in there, the M222 mutation occurs. The people that came with Manny Moore to Connaught and reconquered it were probably a mix of both of these. And so in different proportions, they flow down into these modern surnames. So... It's a case where you have some mixture, a close mutation, and overall, by and large, the annals are right with a little tweaking. Because again, clan cola is not involved here. So, turning now to the south to Munster, Oganakta, Brian Boru, and the Dalgash. Uh, Oganakta were kings of Munster. They're said to be descended from Ailil Olam. And the kingship alternated between lineages of sons seated generally at Cashel. Surnames involved McCarthy, O'Sullivan, O'Callaghan, O'Keefe, Kirby, O'Mahoney, O'Donohue, <coughs> others too, but these are some major ones. Okay, we're going to kind of summarize here DNA versus the annals. <clears throat> There's one group here that all have the CTS4466 marker. It's a very large group. It's the biggest group. And they believe that they are the Ogunak Cashel descendants of the first Christian king of Munster. And if you look at some of these names, O'Sullivan, O'Keefe, O'Donohue's, over 50% of those DNA projects have that marker. So all, all the projects are mixed to some degree, but that's a pretty strong signal. Okay. O'Mahoney's also have a lot with 30%. McCarthy, <laughs> that we kind of would have expected, not quite as much. Uh, and O'Callaghan's not as much. So hmm, that's a little strange. But there was another king that they think was the parent of some of these lineages, Carthar, king of Oganok, Cashel, 1045. And he had a different marker with L362, and that matches the O'Callaghan's pretty well, 12% of their project, and a good chunk of the McCarthy's that uh, he called McCarthy. And a lot of this information came from Nigel McCarthy, who presented here last year. He's not here this year, but he helped me out quite a bit with this beforehand. So overall... There is uh, a lot of DNA evidence of a common origin of the Oganocta in the annals. It's well supported with the caveat that there are multiple McCarthy lineages. This is just a little map of uh, some of the participants that have the CTS4466 marker. Now, one of our favorites, Brian Boru and the Dalgash. Um, as we said, Catherine Swift's going to give a whole presentation on this, so I'm trying to keep it to one slide, one or two slides. But uh, Brian was born along the Shannon River in County Clare, not too far from Limerick. Uh, he was king of the Dalgash and then became high king of Ireland. He's the progenitor of the O'Brien line. So some of his descendants got English titles, became the Earls of Tomond. And so their castle uh, seat is still their Dromoland Castle. Hit the mic. And so they've been found to have a, a certain DNA marker card L226. It's been dubbed Irish Type 3. Dennis Wright of Australia, I think, has uh, done a lot of work around that. And then even further down, some of the uh, O'Briens have like these other markers, FGC5628 and DC1. <clears throat> so just looking at L226 distribution, you can see it is concentrated pretty well around you know, this would be Clare, the Shannon River, right? It is concentrated right in there. 
And I wanted to do an analysis of L226 versus the annals by some particular surnames. So the annals tell us they associate certain surnames in this area with being Dalgash. So I wanted to look at some of those surnames and see what, what kind of correlations we saw. So for the O'Briens, um, they make up, O'Briens make up 13% of this DNA project, RL226. So that's quite a lot. But I also turned around and say, of the surname project, how many of them are L226? Well, it's quite a lot. 19% of their surname project have that signature. So in other words, of the ones we've sampled, 20% of them, one-fifth, are probably descendants of, of Brian Boru. Could you take that outside, please? Okay. Let's look at another surname, Kennedy. 6% uh, of the L226, but only 6% of the surname project have that same marker. So hard to say. Uh, one thing I think that happens with the Kennedy surname is it gets very popular after President John F. Kennedy. And you see, if you look in the actual records, you see people from other places adopting the Kennedy surname. So I think that's maybe distorting that one a little bit because everybody wanted to be a Kennedy. So uh, let's look at another name, though, Casey. Makes up 4% of the L226 cadre, so it's not a big family. There's not a whole bunch of them. They didn't you know, dominate miles and miles of Tipperary or, or Munster. But if you look within their surname, 50% of them have that L226 marker. So there's a lot of cohesion there, a lot of genetic similarity. And same thing on down. Hogan is a surname that I have in my ancestry. It's a sm kind of a small part of the L226 project but a very high percentage of Hogan's have this marker. So again, it's telling us that, you know, that most of these people with this name are descended from that group. Certainly a big chunk. McGrath also pretty good with 23%. So those are the names that I could find some pretty good data on. There are other um, Dagoff surnames like Cashin, Quinn, that just don't have enough, enough samples. So, you know, you can help us. Let's get more samples in, more people <coughs> tested, and we'll go from there. Okay, Leinster. Two uh, kind of big groups out of the annals. The I Kinsella with Ina Kinsella, contemporary of Nile of the Nine Hostages, and the Udun Lang, who were said to be cousins. Those people split into three groups in the 8th century, known as the what became the O'Toole surname, another that became the Fitzdermott and the Larkin surname, and the O'Fallon that became the O'Byrne surname. So looking at the DNA, a lot of these groups are not well sampled. Uh, I have Kinsella's as, oops, excuse me. I have Kinsella's as well, and uh, there's not a DNA project, and uh, there's hardly any samples taken. Murphy, uh, there's no meaningful assembly of, of Leinster DNA, meaning, you know, can we have five men named Murphy whose geography we know comes from Leinster? Uh, I've not seen any data like that, so that's what we need to kind of start drawing conclusions. Same thing for McDermott. I don't see a good assembly of, of Leinster DNA. Um, O'Byrne, though, uh, we do have a good, a good uh, sample. Paul Burns, who's doing a presentation here, has done a real good job of pulling that together, and he's identified a marker, uh, ZZ10, Z255, as a couple of markers that set this lineage out. In my own work on Larkins, I've also identified a similar uh, set of markers, Z10, ZZ10, I should say, and Z253. And they're negative for that L226 marker that we saw in the Dalgosh. So in getting ready for this, so I went back and looked at the analytic pedigrees with uh, Paul's help, and I came to the conclusion that uh, King Lurkin MacFailan, who died in Dublin in 941, he was, he was in the annals, he was probably an eighth cousin to Brian McMarmorda, who was the O'Byrne progenitor of the surname. So that's about the level of DNA match that we see here, and the DNA is supporting the analytic pedigrees. Okay, not to be left out, the Normans. About 1.5% of the population of Ireland have surnames associated with the Normans. Burke, Fitzgerald, Power, Barry, Roach, Butler, Grace, Cusack, Dillon. We're going to talk about the three most powerful dynasties, uh, Butler, Burke, and Fitzgerald. Lords Butler were descended from a Norman family that came to Ireland with King Henry II about 1171. They had very large holdings. Uh, I would characterize them. They were generally loyal to the British monarch. Uh, even though they remained Catholic by and large. And they established the Ormond Palatinate in Tipperary and Kilkenny, where the courts didn't report to the king, they reported to them. 
but the last Marquis of Ormond died without lands in 1997 without male heir. The earldom itself was extinct in 1846. But there's an English estate that remains with the 18th Viscount Montgarrett, who's believed to be a patrilineal descendant of this first Lord Butler. Unfortunately, we don't have his DNA results. So, you know, we need to keep working and, and keep, uh, keep recruiting. If anybody might encounter the uh, Viscount Montgarrett, please encourage him to give a sample. That's the way it goes. That's real life. Let's look at the de Burgs and the Burks. Okay, William de Burg was part of the Norman invasion of Connacht in 1175 and 1200. Uh, he became the Earls of Clan Rickard. The lineage became extinct in 1916, but the surname survives, and the largest group from Ireland is U106, with some sub-markers L48 and Z2, which suggests that Anglo-Saxon Germanic ancestry that we find in the British royal family quite a bit. Fitzgerald. They're descended from Morris Fitzgerald, Lord of Lonsteven. It's a Norman knight that came along with uh, William the Conqueror's group and occupied part of Wales. He was prominent in Strongbow's original invasion force of 1169. If they were, if they were truly Celtic Welsh, we would expect them to be RL21, as the Stuarts of Scotland are. They, of course, became Earls of Leinster and Kildare, built many of the prominent buildings right around here where we're standing. The original earldom exists, but the fortune was lost in the 20th century. They lost all the money. But Morris Fitzgerald, a gardener from Oxfordshire, is currently the ninth Duke of Leinster. So this, this group can be sampled without any excavators being needed. And that lineage is IM253, which is consistent with uh, kind of Norse Viking ancestry, which wouldn't surprise us since William and the Normans got to France by being Vikings. So in summary, genetic genealogy DNA offers exciting new evidence to historians and archaeologists as the sampling coverage and the resolution of the, of the test grows. And those ancient DNA results are starting to come in, and uh, we can expect more in the future. In general, the annals are supported at a high level, Mesolithic population replacement of haplogroups G and I by haplogroup R. At more of a micro or medieval level, the Kanakta, Northern Anile, Oganakta, Dalriata, Clancola have a lot of genetic distinctness. Um, and a lot of people today carry those markers. Exceptions do occur with the Clancola relations and the O'Neill portion of O'Neill. So there are things the annals don't exactly have right, but by and large, they are well supported. And reliable pedigrees back to historical figures, they are few and far between. But when we can find them, they help root our DNA genealogies, our, our DNA results to actual pedigrees. So they're very important. So the work that people do with these deep pedigrees helps us all. I have just a little slide here to remind us that while we do characterizations, all these groups are mixed. This is a plot of, uh, let's say, the top, the Murphy surname, and what percentage of them are in the, the main haplogroups. And we excluded R here because R is so much, it's 80%. It would make the chart go to the right. But you do see some variants such as uh, Murphy... Only about 4% are in haplogroup I, whereas, um, what's a good group here? Pale yellow. Walsh, much higher, over 18%. Johnson, haplogroup I, again, that's not a traditional Irish surname so much, so that doesn't surprise us. It's over 25. But you see there's variants, and in, in almost every surname, there are some <coughs> elements of these haplogroups as well. So it's not, it's not uh, literally true every time, it just gives us a general guide. This is kind of a summary slide of the, of the markers. We found M222 for the O'Neill, Southern O'Neill DF27, Kanakta 2961, and so forth. And so now I'll take questions, and I'll also put this, uh, this pedigree chart on the, uh, on the board and blow it up a little bit. Any questions? Great. Thank you very, very much, Brad. That's great. So, uh, who would like to start off with uh, some questions? Yeah, we have Jared here. Uh, thank you, Brad. That was an excellent, very interesting presentation. Um, if you're interested in checking out the Dalrida, there are about 50 of them buried in Iona Abbey. Mm. Uh, 50 kings of Scotland, Norway, Ireland. And in unmarked um, 
very afraid because all of the grey stones have eroded over time, but they are apparently descended from the gallery. Yeah. Okay. On the, the um, Clan Colla, I generally re refer to that to DF21, mm -hmm. and it's also linked to the uh, Eli O'Carroll. Mm -hmm. But I'm finding a little bit of, uh, you know, a lot of Egan's in there as well. And there seems to be an overlap between them and the high many. I, I, I don't know if you've seen that in your research. Uh, some, sure. Yeah. And, and, and you're, giving, you're giving a presentation? Uh, the, the last one on Sunday evening. Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's lots more. And Jared Corcoran, who asked the question, is going to be given a talk about this in more detail. So, yeah. I kind of tried to do a high level. Specifically with the Dalrita, there are people that are actively researching it, so I'm trying to get them to write a, a scientific paper on it that we can publish in certain DNA journal. So I will remind them about those grave sites, yes? Okay, we have a question here at the back from Kathy. <laughs> I would be covering a lot of the same material as you, but I come from a very different disciplinary background. And um, the name Macaulay is, is based on, on, on the Norse name Olaf. Yeah? Uh, and when you look through the Irish uh, uh, genealogies, um, that name is adopted by Irish families on occasion. So I was very into, well, it's, for example, there's a, a big family in North Cork. Mm -hmm. who are old enough to, in, in background, but who adopt the name Olaf and become Macaulay's. Um, so it's very interesting that you have a mixed pattern uh, among your DNA results for the name Macaulay, and that is from, the from somebody who studies the Irish genealogies in detail. That's the kind of thing you would expect. And also, but you also have a Norse DNA clan for the, the, the people in the, the Outer Hebrides. Mm -hmm. um, and again, given that the name is based on a Norse name. You would expect at least some Macaulay's to have a Norse ancestry. So um, it's very interesting seeing what you're coming to uh, coming up with from the, the DNA background. But I'd have to say that some of the conclusions, I, I would have different views coming from a genealogical background. And that's one of the great things about a conference like this, that we're, we're kind of coming at it from so many different angles. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that, you know, surnames aren't, they aren't one, most of them aren't, uh, one source. I mean, lots of them have multiple sources. I know Larkin certainly does. It's part of how I got involved with genetic genealogies. That there's at least four sources of Larkin in the annals, and that is proving out true with the DNA as well. Any other questions? Do you want to hear, want to hear from Finbar? Yeah, thank you. An excellent presentation. I'm Finbar O'Mahony. Um, since I'm CTS4466 mm -hmm. uh, and an O'Mahony, I was interested that you had the O'Mahony's down as O'Mahony Cashel. Surely they should be O'Mahony Rathlin or Rathlin. Uh, that, that could be. Um, I, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I don't think it could be, but should be. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'd have to, the better man to talk to, that would be Nigel McCarthy, who helped me a lot with uh, the presentation. So um, that's fine. To send that in as a suggestion. Yeah. Finbar and Nigel and Elizabeth Dunham Ross are the project administrators for, oh, the, okay. um, for the Munster Irish project. Yeah. Okay. And, um, uh, you all presented here last year, and in actual fact, the video on YouTube is one of the most popular of all the ones that we did last year, the Munster Irish project. Also. Okay. Well, send me a note on, on, on your point. And uh, Nigel did look at the draft of the presentation beforehand, so um, he gave it a blessing, whether it needs a correction. If it does, we'll, we'll put it in there, no problem. Another question here from Jim, Jim Holleran. Do you have any idea how, how so many of the N222s ended up in County Galway? Well, um, we're told in the annals that, you know, the Connacht conquered what became Connacht um, once, but apparently the Fair Bolg stayed in some measure and rented land so that basically like that's what they talked about Manny Moore is they were uh, occupying land that the Frobolgs paid rent to, but that they actually controlled. So I would say that it was probably expansion of those Northwest um, Kanakta. That's what I think. Because there's a big debate about when M222 happened, 
Uh, some of this seems like it was pretty soon that it might have even been between uh, Khan of the Hundred Battles and Nile of the Nine Hostages, which is, is only, it's not that many generations, but it might be fairly, fairly recent. Any other questions? I have, I have, a, I have a, a little humor. A little humor? Yeah, you said so many Irish seem to go to adopt uh, the Kennedy name. Well, I didn't say they were Irish. I think a lot of them are people, they can be people from Africa or immigrants from other countries that came into English-speaking areas and said, well, we want a cool surname, so. So I don't think then that that many Irish now are adopting the name Obama. <laughs> well, you know, no comment. Maybe it's a first name. No comment. Great. I, I have noticed that there's a, there's a, seems to be a definite contingent of a, uh, Cab drivers uh, from Nigeria here, so you have you have a lot of demic infusion going on right now. Oh yeah, very cosmopolitan. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Brad, for for a fabulous uh, presentation. Um, I think the, the the way that you've summarized everything and the current state of play with regard to DNA and the Irish Annals is absolutely fantastic. Um, I think we need to have you back here in about five years' time to see how this chart is going to change, because I think as more and more people test over the next five years or so. This picture is going to become much more clear, and uh, the, the links between DNA and the ancient animals will be even stronger than they are today. But thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It's muted. It's already muted. Oh, lovely. Okay. Great. Thank well you. Well done. That was great. <coughs> and that